Hi, welcome back. So this is um, with regard to nutrition and exercises in the management of diabetes mellitus. Individualized medical nutrition therapy consisting of counseling, education, and ongoing monitoring is a cornerstone of care for persons with diabetes and prediabetes. Although medical nutrition therapy has many positive outcomes, adherence to a dietary regimen is often challenging for many people. Achieving nutrition, nutritional goals requires a coordinated team effort that takes into account the behavioral, cognitive, socioeconomic, cultural, and religious aspects of the patient. Guidelines from the ADA or the American Diabetes Association indicate that within the context of an overall healthy eating plan, a person with diabetes can eat the same foods as a person who does not have diabetes. This means that the same principles of good nutrition that apply to the general population also apply to the person with diabetes. According to the ADA, the overall goal of medical nutrition therapy is to assist people with diabetes in making healthy nutritional choices that will help to improve metabolic control. Additional specific goals include maintaining blood glucose levels to as near normal as safely as possible to prevent or reduce the risk for complications of diabetes, achieve lipid profiles and blood pressure levels that reduce the risk for cardiovascular disease, prevent or slow the rate of development of chronic complications of diabetes by modifying nutrient intake and lifestyle, address individual nutritional needs while taking into account personal and cultural preferences and respecting the individual's willingness to change and maintain the pleasure of eating by allowing as many food choices as appropriate. The emphasis for nutritional therapy in type 2 diabetes should be placed on achieving glucose, lipid and blood pressure goals. Modest weight loss has been associated with improved insulin resistance. Therefore, weight loss is recommended for all individuals with diabetes who are overweight or obese. There is no one proven strategy or method that can be uniformly recommended. A nutritionally adequate meal plan with appropriate serving sizes, a reduction of saturated and trans fats, and low carbohydrates can bring about decreased calorie consumption. Spacing meals is another strategy that spreads nutrient intake throughout the day. A weight loss of 5% to 7% of body weight often improves glycemic control, even if desired body weight is not achieved. Weight loss is best, best attempted by a moderate decrease in calories and an increase in calorie expenditure. Regular exercise and learning new behaviors and attitudes can help facilitate long-term lifestyle changes. Monitoring of blood glucose levels, hemoglobin A1c, lipids and blood pressure provide feedback on how well the goals of nutritional therapy are being met. Carbohydrates include sugar, starch and fiber. Carbohydrates provide important sources of energy, fiber, vitamins and minerals and are therefore important to all people as well as those with diabetes. The recommended daily allowance for carbohydrates is a minimum of 130, 130 grams per day. Foods containing carbohydrates from fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and low-fat milk should be included as part of a healthy meal, meal plan. Monitor by carbohydrate counting, exchanges, or experienced-based estimation. Glycemic index may provide additional benefit. Foods with a high glycemic index raise glucose levels faster and higher than foods with a low glycemic index. Sucrose-containing food can be substituted for other carbohydrates in a meal plan. Fiber intake should be 25 to 30 grams per day. Non-nutritive sweetness are safe when consumed within FDA daily intake levels. Dietary fat provides energy carries fat-soluble vitamins and provides essential fatty acids. The ADA recommends limiting saturated fat to less than 7% of total calories, less than 200 mg per day of cholesterol, and limited trans fats are also recommended as part of a healthy meal plan. 
decreasing fat and cholesterol intake assists in reducing the risk for cardiovascular disease. Two or more servings of fish per week provide polyunsaturated fatty acids. The amount of daily protein in the diet for people with diabetes and normal renal function is the same as for the general population, 15 to 20 percent of total calories. High protein diets are not recommended for weight loss for people with diabetes. Alcohol inhibits gluconeogenesis by the liver. This can cause severe hypoglycemia in patients taking insulin or oral hypoglycemic medications that increase insulin secretion. Encourage patients to discuss their use of alcohol honestly with their healthcare providers because its use can make blood glucose more difficult to control. Moderate alcohol consumption can sometimes be safely incorporated into the meal plan if blood glucose levels are well controlled and if the patient is not taking medications that will cause adverse effects. Moderate consumption is defined as one drink per day for women and two drinks per day for men. A patient can reduce the risk for alcohol-induced hypoglycemia by eating carbohydrates when drinking alcohol. To decrease the carbohydrate content, recommend the use of sugar-free mixes and drinking dry, light wines. With all individuals, dietary fiber should be included as part of a healthy meal plan. There is no evidence that a person with diabetes should consume more fiber than an individual who does not have diabetes. The current recommendation for the general population is 25 to 30 grams per day. Nutritive and non-nutritive sweeteners may be included in a healthy meal plan in moderation. Non-nutritive sweeteners include the sugar substitute, saccharin, aspartame, sucralose, neotame, and acesulfame potassium. Regular, consistent exercise is an essential part of diabetes and prediabetes management. The ADA recommends that people with diabetes perform at least 150 minutes per week, 30 minutes or 30 minutes five days per week of a moderate intensity aerobic physical activity. The ADA also encourages people with type 2 diabetes to perform resistance training three times a week in the absence of contraindications. Exercise decreases insulin resistance and can have a direct effect on lowering blood glucose levels. It also contributes to weight loss, which decreases insulin resistance. The therapeutic benefits of regular physical activity may result in a decreased need for diabetes medications in order to reach target blood glucose levels. Regular exercise may also help reduce triglycerides and LDL cholesterol levels increase HDL levels, de decrease blood pressure, and improve circulation. <coughs> Any new exercise program for diabetic patients should be started only after medical clearance. Patients should start slowly with gradual progression towards the desired goal. Patients who use insulin, sulfonylureas, or megalitonides are at increased risk for hypoglycemia when there is an increase in physical activity, especially if the patient exercises at the time of peak drug action or if food intake has not been sufficient to maintain adequate blood glucose levels. This can also occur if a normally sedentary patient's patient with diabetes has an unusually active day. The glucose lowering effects of exercise can last up to 48 hours after the activity. So it is possible for hypoglycemia to occur for that long after the activity. It is recommended that patients who use medications that can cause hypoglycemia schedule exercise about one hour after meal or that they have a 10 to 15 gram carbohydrate snack and check their blood glucose level before exercising. Small carbohydrate snacks can be taken every 30 minutes during exercise to prevent hypoglycemia. Patients using medications that place them at risk for hypoglycemia should always carry a fast-acting source of carbohydrate such as glucose tablets or hot candies when exercising. Although exercise is generally beneficial to blood glucose levels, strenuous activities can be perceived by the body as a stress 
causing a release of counter-regulatory hormones that result in a temporary elevation of blood glucose. In a person with type 1 diabetes who is hyperglycemic and ketotic, exercise can worsen hyperglycemia and ketosis. Therefore, vigorous activity should be avoided if the blood glucose level exceeds 300 mg per deciliter and if ketones are present in the urine. If hyperglycemia is present without ketosis, it is not necessary to postpone exercise. Pancreas transplantation Pancreas transplantation can be used as a treatment option for patients with type 1 diabetes. Usually it is done for patients who have end-stage kidney disease and who have had or plan to undergo kidney transplantation. Kidney and pancreas transplantations are often performed together or a pancreas may be transplanted after the kidney transplantation. Pancreas transplantation alone is rare. If renal failure is not present, the ADA recommends that pancreas transplantation be considered only for patients who exhibit the following three criteria. A history of frequent, acute, and severe metabolic complications, example hypoglycemia, hyperglycemia or ketoacidosis, necessitating medical attention. Secondly, clinical and emotional problems with exogenous insulin therapy that are so severe as to be incapacitating. And three, consistent failure of insulin-based management to prevent acute complications. Successful pancreas transplantation can improve the quality of life of people with diabetes, primarily by eliminating the need for exogenous insulin, frequent blood glucose measurements, and many of the dietary restrictions imposed by the disorder. Transplantation can also eliminate the acute complications commonly experienced by patients with type 1 diabetes, like hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia. However, pancreas transplantation is only partially successful in reversing the long-term renal and neurological complications of diabetes. The patient will also require lifelong immunosuppression to prevent rejection of the graft. Complications can result from immunosuppressant therapy. Pancreas, pancreatic islet cell transplantation is another potential treatment measure. During this procedure, the islet cells are harvested from the pancreas of a deceased organ donor. Most recipients require the use of two or more pancreases. The islet cells are infused via a catheter through the upper abdomen into the portal vein of the liver. With only the islet cells transplanted, pain and recovery time are diminished in comparison with whole pancreas transplantation. Currently, this procedure is experimental in the United States and research is continuing to determine the best ways to implant the islet cells and to prevent their rejection.